Hello, my name's Stephen Goodfellow. If you'll bear with me for the next 10 minutes, I'll show you something that would completely change the way you perceive the universe. In this short video, I'll illustrate my outrageous assertion that the sun is a shell of hydrogen with an absolute vacuum interior, a vacuum that induces gravity. Furthermore, I should support this assertion with the empirical observations that I've collected over the past 30 years. Are you ready? Good. Let's begin. Milk added to a stirred cup of coffee outlines a vortex, which consists of a high-pressure exterior and a low-pressure center. The vortex behaves in a manner identical to that of the planets orbiting the Sun in that both phenomena obey Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Whether it be clotted cream swishing around a low-pressure center or a planet orbiting our Sun, their behavior is essentially identical. Now, this is the interesting part. The depression in the center of the coffee is a relative absence of matter producing an effect identical to that of planets and sun mutually attracted to one another. In other words, one event is brought about by a concentration of mass and the other by an absence thereof. This induced gravitational attraction takes on many related manifestations in nature, some of which we're likely to come across whether it be in the form of water going down a drain or a whirlpool in a river. On a larger scale, hurricanes. And tornadoes. Although the spiral galaxy's means of propagation remain a mystery, one cannot but be struck by the similarities between these and their more earthly counterparts. Consider the organ with which we hear, the eardrum. Sounds that the inner ear receives and decodes are compressional waves, that is, areas in which there is more air between troughs of less air, or high and low pressures. Through vibration, the ear translates these waves into electrochemical impulses which are then sent to the brain, and that should be all there is to it, except that the ear actually performs another seemingly unrelated function. The ear has semicircular canals which inform the brain as to your position in relation to our planet's gravitational field. Now that is really, really incredible. One organ performing two seemingly different tasks. One part of the eardrum works with pressure, the other with gravity. Now, if pressure and gravity are two fundamentally distinct and separate forces, should one not expect to find two fundamentally distinct and separate organs to discern these forces? After all, this is the natural order of things. The heart, uniquely suited to pump blood, fulfills its specialized role lungs specifically supply oxygen to the blood. So why should the inner ear neatly perform two functions? Could it be that pressure and gravity are two manifestations of the same force? Dictionaries define a vacuum as a space absolutely devoid of matter. And although this seems a reasonable statement, it is not correct. A better definition would be, a vacuum is a volume with no space in it. Wherever we look in the universe, absolute vacuums are nowhere to be observed. Now, that is pretty astonishing because, for the longest time, space was thought to be an absolute vacuum. When Einstein produced his work on relativity in the early part of the 20th century, he had no way of knowing that space was not a vacuum. We know that light travels upon the fabric of space, but no observation has ever been made of light propagating through an absolute vacuum. Even in the thinnest intergalactic space, any given cubic centimeter is awash in activity, virtual particles spontaneously coming into existence and then blink out again. Radiation permeates this thinnest of space. Whole atoms, unhindered, reach such high velocities that a plethora of them pass through a given cubic centimeter at any given time. 
Space is a fabric of mass energy, and the laws of pressure are just as relevant in outer space as within the boundaries of our own atmosphere. It is just on a much, much bigger scale. Let us now perform a simple thought model. Let's imagine that I, by calling upon some mysterious power, can force mass energy out of a given volume. Bah! There you go. The first thing you notice is that it would form into a sphere because of the pressure of the air pushing in equally from all sides. If you were able to observe the sphere, which you can't and I'll explain why shortly, it would be completely dark. Within this volume, there's no time and there's no temperature. Now, the reason you could not look directly into this absence of mass energy is because the exterior atmosphere would fall on it with such intense pressure that it would glow. And that attraction, that crushing in of the exterior air, would be indistinguishable from gravity. Now, could such objects really exist in reality? Together with solid, liquid and gas, plasma is the fourth state of matter. Our sun is a large charged plasma ball. Because the sun is rotating, this creates a dynamo effect which allows the plasma to exist as a single unified magnetic entity. How powerful is this effect? If you look at the shifting structures in the sun's outer layers, you will see quite plainly that they are not visibly affected by the crushing gravitational attraction of the sun. This is because the gravitational force is some 10 to the 33 times weaker than the magnetic force. In other words, it only takes a fraction of the plasma's magnetic potential to overcome the gravitational influence of the sun. Here are three persuasive observations that led me to believe that the sun propagates in this manner. The first is sunspots. Sunspots are dark depressions in the sun's photosphere. And the reason they are dark is because we are looking in towards the absolute vacuum of the sun through this temporary thinning of the solar hydrogen. The second is helioseismology. Scientists have discovered that the sun rings much like a bell. These oscillations are much easier to propagate through a thin plasma shell rather than through an increasingly dense object. One might compare a bowling ball and a bell. The bell is much more likely to successfully oscillate. The next is angular momentum. If the sun formed by accretion of interstellar matter, then our sun ought to be rotating much, much faster than it is. Like a spinning ice skater accelerating by drawing in their arms, the sun in the center of the solar system ought to have the lion's share of angular momentum. But when we look at the system, we find that Jupiter, our largest outer gas planet, has the majority of angular momentum. Jupiter rotates once every 10 hours, whereas the sun only rotates once every 30 days. Picture a protostar somewhat heavier than Jupiter. The dense pressure of the interior inaugurates nuclear fusion. The dynamo effect created by the rapidly rotating protosun supplies a unifying magnetic field for the plasma. Magnetic repulsion occurs, an outward flow of plasma. The protosun rapidly expands, and in doing so, like a spinning skater putting their arms out, the rotation slows. This inflation of the sun leaves non-space in its wake. Induced gravitational attraction is brought about, restraining the further outward flow of matter. The opposing forces of magnetic repulsion and induced gravitational attraction brings the solar shell into equilibrium. The sun's shell of matter is heated under pressure from the magnetic plasma repulsion and the induced gravitational attraction. And now the process repeats. The sun is in its sustaining cycle. The dense pressure of the sun's matter crushing in on the non-space heats it, sustaining nuclear fusion, which in turn sustains the plasma. The fuel is hydrogen. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. Goodbye.